I started taking pictures because I wanted to make films. I found a way to make films through putting stills together by making slideshows. Those are my films. I'm going to have a retrospective that opens in 2022 in Sweden. I'm being presented as a filmmaker. So there's going to be seven of my most important slideshows. I thought we could start by talking about Memory Lost the Peace. The show itself has five major elements to it. They're kind of companion pieces, but they're not directly relevant to each other. Memory Lost itself is a digital slideshow. It's my most major piece I've done since The Ballad of Sexual Dependency, and it's the first time it'll be shown in America. My friend Guido Costa, who I've been very close to and worked with for 25 years, said, why don't you do a piece about your addiction and interview scientists and other specialists on addiction, on the chemistry of it. It was very scary for me to make this piece. It involved going into archival material that I hadn't looked at in many years. I have tens of thousands of slides in my archive and I dug into that material. It's entirely made from work from the past and it was really painful to make it. It's basically about the darkness that can come with addiction. It's about a time when the walls are closing in and memory is blacked out for many portions of those years. It came from that, it's, it's a painful piece. When we went into quarantine, you would often say that quarantine was very familiar to mm -hmm. you, that you'd been in quarantine for many years. And I think what captures that very clearly in your work is in memory lost, although it's a different kind. No, that's quarantine. That was self-imposed quarantine, or drug-imposed quarantine. And I lived like that off and on for about 15 years. So quarantine comes easy to me. But in the the three years that I'd been sober before quarantine, before the pandemic, I had learned to go outside every day. And I would found out where I'm placed in the world. I didn't actually know that I was old. Mm -hmm. And I learned that in those years. How did you choose the prints from memory loss? I was asked to choose a picture to run an ad in Art Forum, and that's when I decided it would be really interesting to actually print images from memory loss, not just show the piece. And the piece is very immersive and intense, and these pictures stand on their own, also as abstractions almost, mm -hmm. and pieces from the mind. Like, they're camera mistakes, mostly. And I feel like well, before there were apps to allow you to make mistakes, mm -hmm. They were actual mistakes, mm -hmm. and they're kind of magic. And I, I want to celebrate the magical quality of these pieces of my photographs. You talked about sirens. It was born out of trying to find pleasure while you were working on Memory Lost. Yeah, yeah it was. And there's so many different sources in it. There's Danielle Luna. Donna Yale was the first black supermodel in the 60s. She was discovered as a Catholic school girl in Detroit and brought to New York and she became a big star. And she hung out with Brian Jones and Dolly and lived in Europe. She wasn't really accepted in America. And so in Europe, there was a much more reception for her. She never wanted to talk about race. She never wanted to accept that she was black. She talked about herself as an Egyptian princess, and she died at 33 from a heroin overdose. So I wanted to make an homage to her, and she's in the Benet piece at the beginning. She's in a clip from Satyricon, and then it, it ends with her screen test by Warhol. A big part of our lockdown was watching movies together in film school, um, you showing me movies throughout your history, us exploring movies together. And also you started 
your position on Metrograph, your permanent guest program right there. <laughs> and so we've gotten to see uh, the films that you do for them. Someday I'll make a, a real film, one of these days. I mean, I have many ideas, but... Do you want to talk about some of your ideas? I always wanted to make a film about a couple that meet on a Greyhound bus. And it's about this dysphoria of uh, relationships. It shows violence as absolutely mundane, which is really important to me because violence is not exciting or pretty or there's no, you know, soundtrack to violence. Mm -hmm. It's just mundane. So I wanted to somehow capture that mundanity of violence. And then, of course, there's all of Patricia Highsmith's books, which I've been reading since somebody gave me one in a bar in 1983. The show includes your earliest work and your latest work, yeah. both periods of your life where you were living with transsexuals. Exactly. And so the early black and whites are a document of your roommates and your friends in Boston. And the new work is it's about my roommate. <laughs> it's about us. Yeah. And, and we met because you interviewed me. Yeah. We were introduced through your former studio manager, Sam Rack, but we met a few days before Christmas. You started asking me questions and I didn't stop talking, which is not what I'm always like with people yeah. that I just met. And then we started hanging out a lot. Mm -hmm. I'm so lucky because I met you. I got to know you more like January, and then when the pandemic hit, it was a godsend that you moved in with me, that it couldn't have been a luckier thing. Yeah, to me too. I would have not maintained my sanity or my sobriety if you hadn't moved in. Yeah, a lot has happened since I moved in. I turned 30. I'm in a new stage of my life. I'm living with someone who sees me you said something recently that I'd never thought of about documenting the story of our relationship through my face. Exactly. It's amazing how much your face changes over a year of knowing you. It's the totally different face than I saw at the beginning. I think if people watch each other, that happens in relationships. A lot of it happens in relationships is people stop looking at each other. Mm -hmm. And I constantly watch your face, and that's what these pictures are a testimonial to. They're the most important to me. And the relationship to light and dark, the chiaroscuro, the reference to the Renaissance painting, they're the most painterly, and there's so much about flesh, visible and invisible. And what lights up is the eyeball, mm -hmm. which is very beautiful to me. Those pictures are like another step in our relationship. You and them are very calm mm -hmm. and very present. And I'm coming from a different point with them. When I meet someone and I don't feel like they know how beautiful they are and they haven't really fit into their body in a certain way, that I need to show them that. like. I want to show people how beautiful they are. And that was true with you. Yeah. And it's true with all my friends that are in the slideshow, the other side. That's the piece that's in the show that's most about the history of friends and all the friends I've lost. Most of the people in the slideshow are dead. I guess photographs keep memory alive in a certain way that I don't feel those people are dead. They're so present still in my life and I can't experience their death in a certain way yeah. because they're so with me in my work. Well, you know, I, I lost a friend recently and seeing her image everywhere made it feel like she was in my life more than she had been uh, right before she passed. Yeah. yeah, I think mourning is really important and it's there's not room for death in this culture, and there's not enough uh, rituals of mourning or even understanding how mourning works and how it, it metabolizes, how it continues and changes when we lose people. The reason I brought back The Other Side as a book 
and why it's so important to be shown in this exhibition is that the times have changed so much since the days when I lived with drag queens. Mm -hmm. The language has changed so much and I feel like people need to know the history of the first pioneers who really paved the way for them. I really feel like without them, there wouldn't be this kind of trans revolution in which people are accepted because they lived in a world where it was dangerous to go outside in the day. So it's pretty incredible to me that I've lived long enough to see being trans, being trans as an acceptable posture to take in the world. Yeah, in the early 90s, you wrote in the introduction to the other side about how much things had changed in those 20 years from when you started photographing to then and what the kinds of jobs and opportunities were available at that point. And then you wrote a new intro a few years ago for the reissue. And the progress is dizzying. Yeah. And yeah, it is. I mean, there's still, you know, an epidemic of murder of trans people, particularly black trans women, that has not gone away. And as I write in the book, I feel it's most important to be focused on that and not on shaming each other about language. This slideshow is dedicated to the trans sisters lost to violence. You're showing the other side slideshow analog for the first time in 14 years. Yeah. It's the way I perceive my work, the way I'm used to showing my work for 30 years before digitally. It's the noise of the projectors, the sound of the clicking. It's like music to me. It's like my mm. favorite old tune. The major thing about the slideshows is I can constantly re-edit and update them. They're constantly changing and evolving and I actually found new pictures that I had never used before, which is exciting to me. Yeah. Some of these prints that you're making for the show are printed, dye sublimation printing on aluminum. Yeah, That's the also first the time. new for you. Yeah. At first I thought it was terrible. Like it was too analog, look I mean, digital looking too much of the times now. But then somebody showed me one of you where the black was so dark and deep and so the skin is so light and luminous and I got completely converted. And now the work of you and the work from Memory Lost is both on Daiso. And you've also hung your photos of skies from all of your travels all over the world from the last 30 years. You hang your skies unframed. Um, yeah, that's new for me too. They're big and they're hung on frame because it's meant to speak to the fact that the sky is unframed. I want to speak to that with these big pictures floating in the air. I've been photographing skies and landscape all along since the 80s. I like the ones that are fuzzy and that are kind of ethereal and non-specific mm -hmm. and... Technical mistakes. <laughs> yeah, always. But I, I had this desire to photograph nothingness. And this is as close as I've gotten. Knowing you as well as I do, I'm able to see the things that move you the most. And I think what's touched you has been the messages you've received from the Drug Users Union and for harm reduction groups that you work with more than anything else. I realized the my way to fight politically during lockdown was to do these print sales for the groups that I most support. I mean, we went to protests when... George Floyd was murdered. Yeah. When Black Lives Matter took to the streets in such a major, major way. And, but all during the lockdown and continuing till just now, I did these print sales. and. Marion Goodman Gallery actually presented the first one, very supportive of me in that way. And we raised 35,000 for the Drug Users Union and they used it to buy what's called a mass spectrometer, 
which tests little tiny bits of drugs and can say what's in them. And it saves people's lives, literally. So now they've named the mass spectrometer NAN. Mm -hmm. uh, gratitude to me. The idea that I've been called a harm reductionist is from the drug, by the drug users union is the most important moving thing to me. It's really, I mean, I care about that more than I care about most things. Yeah. I care about fighting for a safe world for drug users where they can survive and preventing overdoses. And that's what I've been working hardest. I mean, there's a, at the end of Memory Loss, the piece, there's old Super 8 footage that I took in Provincetown. And the voiceover is Gabor Mate talking about how human it is to use drugs. And I think that fights the stigma, which is what's killing everybody. Mm -hmm. And now the Sacklers are in bankruptcy court and they're going to get away with it, is what we fear.